up a hunger in my heart. Nothing will satisfy me. Nothing else will do. Stir up a hunger. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for a time of communion. The above slide shows a boat docked at the San Leandro Marina. I really love boats. Back in Texas, when I was young, and my family went out to shop for a new boat, we once went to a boat conference, and we would marvel going from boat to boat, and especially those large yachts where one could go in climb up the stairs and roll into the beds and walk into the kitchen. And we were going to have such a great time pretending we were living on the boat. I mean, these boats have like radar, space, you can go fishing on the decks, etc. And boats are like for people like myself who are introverts. And we like being independent. I mean, you can plan on buying supplies, go for several weeks on the ocean. However, isn't it just like the pandemic? I mean, at the start of the shelter in place, 
we were all in our boats, kind of isolated, almost like pitching tents. You know, we kind of go out and shop and get our toilet paper and store up food. And it was kind of thrilling at first by camping. You know, maybe we could survive for a few weeks and then everything would be normal again. But the weeks, they dragged on to months and months onto many months. People became and felt isolated, down and depressed. As a primary care doctor, months into the pandemic, elderly patients would come in uh, for an appointment and tell me they were just ordering food to be delivered. They would have family come by to deliver their food. Um, they had not left their homes for months and this was the first trip outside their home to come and see me in the doctor's office. I mean, how honored and humble did I feel? I told them that, but in the next breath, I also advise that they also live healthier, go out and exercise in safe places, and meet with others who are equally as bubbled and isolated as they were, to have friends and, and even family who stay safe together. I ask them to come back into the dock from their isolated boats to be with others, to refuel, to get supplies after being isolated so long. I mean, maybe during the pandemic, you were in your own boat, isolated for a while and drifted away physically and spirit spiritually without the regularity of like going to work going to Bible study, even the church on Sundays, or seeing others. Maybe we're a student at school or volunteering regularly, and that all disappeared. Make the effort to come back to the shore and dock, to be with others, be with Christians, to fellowship. At church on Sundays, if we're still holding pergola, and parking lot services in a safe way. Enroll and come onto the Zoom meetings on Sundays because God is calling you back against Satan's will. We were, we were never meant to be so alone. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. Talking about Jesus Christ. And as you can see in the next slide, although communion is a private matter with us and God, it is for us, plural, as Christians, he was pierced for our transgressions, our iniquities. Promisement that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We were never meant to be alone. In intimate connection with God, yes, but never to be alone physically and to be together. So let us bow and pray right now. Thank you, God. We remember your bread, your body as its representation broken for us. And we remember the wine and the blood, sin's pardon. Turn your lighthouse on so we may come back to shore to see the light, a new, stronger and wider path back to you. Help us be unified 
in this time of communion with other believers. Amen. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, when I found joy of reaching your heart when my will becomes enthralled in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you I worship you to worship you.
Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. You are loved. Let's get praying. Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your presence, and we are in your presence in each one of our homes. And though we have many concerns, lack of rain, as well as COVID surging and claiming many and haunting many, Lord, our, our country has been attacked by ourselves. And Lord, I pray right now you'd help each one of us in our own way to be the kingdom of God, where we stand, where we sit. Lord, we know that kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall, empires come and go, but the word of God endures forever and that your kingdom will never end. And it's in that kingdom that we rejoice today. Lord, help us to be people that are your subjects in your kingdom. Lord, help us to always be people of prayer, praying as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 17, starting with verse 20. It's talking about the kingdom of God. I like the shows on TV, HG Channel and so on, which shows people fixing up houses, people buying houses, making changes after that, and so on. And it's always kind of intrigued me or sometimes repelled me when I see people going into a perfectly good house and they'll say very melodramatically, oh, the floors are hideous, who could live in this? Oh, the cabinets, they have to go. These counters, throw them away. We really have to do everything. To tell you the truth, it looks good to me. And so what I'm kind of wondering is when Jesus is being asked two questions about the kingdom of God here. In verse 20, he's asked the where, and in verse, uh, excuse me, the when, and in verse 37, he's asked the where. I kind of wonder what Jesus feels when people are asking about the kingdom of God if they might have some suggestions for him as to how it would be more attuned to their liking. And so Jesus talks in this section about the kingdom of God, but he does so in a manner that is kind of intent on curbing their enthusiasm. In other words, letting them know it's not exactly going to be what you thought it would be if you got to design it. And so he's going to communicate a few things to us. The first thing he's going to uh, communicate is that the kingdom of God is right here, sort of. My goodness, what does that mean? In verse 21, it says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Some translations put it as, the kingdom of God is within you, which is a good translation, but it's a hard pill to swallow because Jesus is talking to the Pharisees at that point. And many of us don't really think that the kingdom of God is alive and well in the hearts of the Pharisees. But what Jesus is saying in general is that the kingdom of God, when they're asking it, when is it? He's saying, it's here for you to touch right now. It's all around you. Now, we're not exactly all sure what that might always mean. They're, we're not going to go into everything on the kingdom of God. But some person might think, wow, if it's right here, I should be able to learn a lot really fast about what the kingdom of God is if, if I'm in the middle of it. And so Jesus gives them three knots to let them know it may not be exactly what they thought. First knot they give, he gives in verse 20, is that it's not to be observed. It says, it is not something that can be observed. Wow. In verse 21 and 23, he says it's not locatable. He says there will be people who say, oh, the kingdom's over here. It's over there. He says, don't follow after them. Or the Son of Man, oh, look, he's here. No, he's there. He says, don't follow them. You can't really point to a spot on the map for a time and say, there's the kingdom of God. The third knot that he has is that it's not going to be there necessarily when you want it. Verse 22 says, you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Now, what all does that mean? Well, for the disciples, it could have meant that there's coming a time in which Jesus is ascended in heaven and they sure wish they had Jesus walking next to them like he used to. But that's not in God's plan, and so that's not going to happen. It might be for some of us, we look back and 
You know, history in our old lives, really remembering back in the good old days when the church was really on fire and part of the community and part of society. And uh, evidently, that's not the plan right now either. Maybe we can look back at a time in our lives in which we were dynamic, on fire. Wish we could get to that. Or maybe we look at our country, look at our world, and we say, Oh, Lord, rule, be a king. Kick some people around. Let's get this place shaped up. And Jesus is here saying, I'm not here for your nostalgia. I'm not here to do your bidding. I'm not here to bail you out. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. The second thing that he kind of uh, underscores is that the kingdom of God has a schedule. Sort of. Verse 24. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. The idea here is not so much the horizon as far as the space, but how fast lightning goes. Grease lightning, it is very, very fast. What does it mean if he's coming soon? That's an important verse, the second to last verse in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20 says this. Jesus says, surely I am coming soon. Then John adds, amen, come Lord Jesus. And what does it mean soon? Well, it evidently it doesn't mean within 2,000 years because that hasn't happened. In actuality, the word that's used there in Greek, taxu, which is spelled T-A-X-U, in case you want to use it in Scrabble someday, it uh, means it comes fast, quickly. It doesn't mean necessarily soon as in, soon normally assumes a point of reference. Let's say the point of reference is me and my time. That's what most people have as their point of reference. And soon means somewhere close to me. That's not what this means. Quick means like a bolt of lightning was a thousand years ago fast. And a thousand years from now, a bolt of lightning will be fast. But those bolts of lightning are a long way away from now. The idea is when Jesus comes, he's going to come fast. Maybe not soon, but he's coming fast. Right now, he's sitting on a throne in heaven to the right hand of the Father. There he is ruling the universe. There he is interceding for the saints. There he is celebrating with the saints. He is encouraging people. It's an awesome place and an awesome time. But he's not coming here right now because if he was coming, he'd be here. But there is coming a day in which Jesus is going to tie up the laces on his sandals. He's going to have that big old white horse, whatever that means from the book of Revelation. He's going to put one foot in the stirrup, swing up the right, up and over the top. And once he does that, bam, he's here. Not going to be like the disaster movies in which there's an asteroid coming and it's three months out and they have to build a rocket to blow it up. Now, but because when he comes, he's going to come fast is going to catch people off guard. And that's when it talks to us about three individuals, Noah, Lot, and Lot's wife, in the verses that follow. And it talks about what life was like for people at the time disaster came upon their communities. It says, putting the two lists together, it says they will be eating and drinking, marrying and getting married, buying and selling, planting and building. None of those are sinful things. Oftentimes we think about Sodom and Gomorrah or the pre-flood humanity. We're told those were horrible places, horrible people. But these are not horrible things. Trust me, if he wanted us to get the idea that it was sin that they were doing, that he was mad at, he would have plenty of sins to choose from, not these. These are fine, basic things. These are the things people do when they think they have all the time in the world. Build their dream home. Plant a field, get married. We got the future in front of us. But evidently they didn't because disaster swept on in. It's the type of thing that you do when you expect all to be well. Now, I know oftentimes we talk about the coming of the Lord and in reality the tribulation. This lets us know because oftentimes people are saying, man, times are terrible. Jesus must almost be here. Jesus lets us know in this that it could be that he's going to come when everything is pretty nice. You don't know. The third thing it commu communicates to us is that the kingdom of God is all we ever wanted. Sort of. Verse 31. On that day, 
no one who is in the housetop with his possessions inside should go down and get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. He's saying when Jesus comes, don't go back. You don't need it. Can you imagine a person in the front lawn? Jesus is coming back and he says, great, Jesus, good to see you. My smartphone is on the coffee table. Can I grab it real quick so we can do some selfies? That's not going to happen. The person who sees Jesus come and says, Jesus, my hair, can I please get a hat? I can't go into heaven like this. How about the person who says, you know what, we're told when the fires are going on in California to keep all the essential things you want near the door so you can grab it. My essential stuff is just inside. Family photo albums. I need those, Jesus. Let me grab them. I'll be right with you. No. Even those things are precious and wonderful and adorable. Um, Jesus says, no, you don't need them. It goes on to other things. It says in verse 33, that the person trying to hold on to their life is going to lose it. The person who loses their life will find it. When he's talking about life there, he's not talking about our pulse or our breath. He's talking about our lifestyle, the thing we put together, our normalness. Oftentimes we wonder, when will things get back to normal? Well, that's one of the things, unfortunately, it's saying, trying to keep things normal when Jesus comes back is going to be impossible. And the person struggling to do that is going to be sorely disappointed. But the person who puts everything that they've ever had or ever done on the altar before God and say, Lord, it is all yours. None of it's mine. Do as you wish. That person is going to be in for the time of their life. But then there's one more thing in our world that's going to be disrupted in that, and that's relationships. It says in verses 34 through 36 that uh, people are going to be working side by side, one taken, one left. Two people in the house, one taken, one left. Two people afield, one taken, one left. We have people we love, we work with, we spend time, our roots grow together. But like it says in the parable of tares is that when it comes time for separation, the roots are going to upend and there's going to be separation. We have our world and we like it usually. But when Jesus comes back, there will be separation. Our worlds can be nice and comfortable for us. But when he comes, the kingdom of God is not about recreating what we've already had. It's a brand new thing. The last thing he wants to throw out to us is that the kingdom of God will find you. And no sort of in that title. It's just the kingdom of God will find you. They ask the question in verse 37, where the kingdom is. And so he, the, the verse 37 goes this way. Where, Lord, they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Is that a bizarre verse or what? I mean, I have seen lots of Christian uh, greeting cards, and I've never seen that verse used. I've seen lots of nice little plaques and posters on people's walls. That one's never used, okay? What is the idea on this verse? Uh, you know, where is the kingdom of God? It's basically saying the kingdom of God will find you. That's what it's saying. Just as a group of buzzards doesn't need a map, to go find the carcass. They'll find it fine on their own. So the Christian who has Jesus in their heart, the kingdom will find them quite easily. The angels of God will find them just fine. Blessing and worship and counsel will find them just fine. But also the person who has the works of the flesh in their life, their anger, their rage, the factions, all that sort of stuff, well, the buzzards won't exactly need a map to find them either. And it's in this context that I want to really kind of talk about our current scenario because our country has been blindsided by a lot of anger and a lot of rage that's been going on with the uh, domestic terrorism that's gone into invading the capital. And we're told that uh, armed conflict might be happening in different capitals across the U.S. as well as the main capital on Inauguration Day. I'm not sure what's going to happen. We're recording this on uh, Thursday night, the 14th. I don't know what's happening tomorrow. We don't know. But we do know one thing, that there is a lot of anger and a lot of rage out there. Do I think that this is an uh, end times thing? No. No, I don't think that at all. I might be, but no. Do I think it's a 1776 type thing? No, that would be a wrong comparison. That had Continental Congress and colonies that had 
representatives and elections and stuff like that. It's, it's not that. It's its own thing. I kind of view it more in connection with 2020 and the social unrest and the anger and the days of rage and all that. Only on steroids, because to tell you the truth, there are some armed groups that have been aching for a fight with the Federals for decades, and this might be their best chance at it. I don't know what's going to happen. But there's a lot of angry people, a lot of raging people, and in reality, in the name of freedom, from all sections of our spectrum, America might prove itself to be ungovernable. And I hope we don't get what we're wishing for in that regard. But what do we do with anger and rage? We have no control over anybody else. We don't. All we do is have control over the little bit of the kingdom of God that is in where, where we put our own feet. What do we do with anger and rage? Why are people angry and raging? Because it feels good. It does. In the, the um, uh, Broadway musical, Wicked has one song called Loathing. It's all about how it feels so good to loathe somebody. Hey, I love shoot 'em ups, especially like Clint Eastwood type shoot, -up, shoot 'em ups. And those are the types of things in which it has a person who's the evil villain and it. they really make you hate him. I mean, he's the one who kicks puppies and slaps around innocent people and it gets you worked up. So when he finally is blown away, you go, yeah. That's the feeling. It feels good to get worked up. It feels good to hate and have anger. It hits the adrenal glands, makes us feel alive. Here's the thing that frustrates me so much. I know I get worked up. I know I get angry about a fictitious story. There's nothing real about it. And on top of that, there I am. I'm in my recliner. My roof doesn't leak. My bills are paid. My health is good. My family is great. I have my chips and salsa. And for some reason, I'm angry. Anger and rage is easy. Here's the problem. Anger and rage can be like that stray dog or stray cat. If you feed it, you won't ever have to go look for it again. It will find you. Just like the verse we talked about. The vultures won't need a map. They can find you. Wow. Conversely, Child of God, you have the fruits of the Spirit in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When, you when you're looking for encouragement from God, He will get that to you. When you need that prayer partner from God, He will get that to you. You need the blessing. He will get that to you. You need the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. A special Bible verse from Him. He will get that to you. And if you have the rage and the anger, the buzzards won't exactly need a map to find you, now will they? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be full of the fruits of the Spirit. Help us to be absent of the works of the flesh, that we might be solid people in your kingdom, being a counterculture of joy and love and comfort in times that are crazy, our trust is in you, God. Please rule over us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.